Troops have moved out of some areas of the Chernobyl area and western Ukraine, but they're building their presence now in the east. Julian is here to break down what those movements look like. Julian. Jason, that's right. We've been hearing for a while that as the Kremlin pulled out areas here in the north around the capital into Belarus and into Russia, they're instead putting their attention over here in the eastern and southeastern part of the country there in the Donbass region. Now, we have satellite imagery backing up that. We've actually seen military deployments here moving from Veluki down towards across the border and into the Ukraine. But let's take a closer look across the border into the Ukraine at the town of Vilkuvatka. These images that I want I want to show you right here actually showing those troop movements and I want to blow these up for you that way you can take a closer look at them. You can see here the Russian convoy moving here and I want to show you a closer look at it where you can actually see the armored vehicles here. You can see armored vehicles and tanks moving across into into the Ukraine very close to the town of Kharkiv. But I want to show you just how close they are to that city of Kharkiv. We've seen recent attacks reports saying the city has seen 53 artillery and rocket attacks in the past 24 hours. That convoy is only 63 miles away from Kharkiv. And to put that into context for you, that's a little over the distance between here in Hickory, North Carolina or here in Chester, South Carolina. So put Putting into context just how close that Russian convoy is to cities that we've seen under siege. And why, and Jason, back to you. Thank you, Julian. Leaders in Western countries are sending more aid, supplies, and weapons to Ukraine. Experts say Western weaponry is what's helping troops blunt Russian attacks, but Russian troops are making headway in stopping the historic arms express. Retired Colonel Mark Kansian is joining us this morning, also a senior advisor for the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Colonel, good to have you here with us this morning again. Thanks for having me on the show. What are we seeing in terms of Russian troop movement and, and kind of somewhat of a new phase in this <clears throat> conflict? We are in a new phase. You know, the first phase was the first couple of days where they tried this blitzkrieg onto uh, Ukrainian cities that failed. Then there was a step-by-step -step where they tried to expand their um, their gains. That also failed. Now they've pulled back from the north and they're concentrating on the east in the Donbass region. Uh, this is something that militarily they should have done long ago. The Russians uh, dispersed their efforts and uh, were not able to gain a lot of success. By focusing on the Donbass, they do a couple of things. First, they're focusing where they've had the greatest military success. That's also where there are a lot of separatists where uh, in 2014, the uh, separatists and the Russians took over a slice of uh, eastern Ukraine, trying to expand that um, slice of territory, maybe get behind the Ukrainians who were defending there, uh, which would put them in a difficult position, maybe cause their uh, positions to crack. We know that just this week, uh, Russia announced a new <coughs> commander, General Alexander Dvornikov. Uh, from what it appears to be, not a nice man. I mean, the, a mass murderer in Syria years ago. What does this suggest? Maybe the frustrations uh, of what Russia has seen over the last 49 days and what their plans might be with this new general at the top. Well, Dvornikov was the commander of the Southern District. He would be the natural person to be put in charge. He does have a, a brutal reputation. He was in uh, Syria, for example, and presided over uh, uh, some very uh, brutal operations there. Um, there's a long, unfortunately, Russian tradition of commanders focusing on military success at whatever cost to the troops and suffering it might inflict on civilians. This also represents a, a change in the Russian uh, approach. They put a single commander in charge, something they should have done uh, weeks ago. Uh, I think it indicates that they're focusing on the East and the Donbass. It also means that they've scaled back their war aims that they aren't trying to take over the whole country. Uh, they're just trying to increase their uh, holdings uh, in the east. And we know as those Russian troops shift and move towards the east, uh, Ukrainian soldiers and, and civilians are encountering landmines that are left behind. Uh, how dangerous is that and, and what we could see in the coming days and weeks? Well, landmines, of course, can be extremely dangerous. Uh, there are two kinds. There are the anti-personnel uh, landmines that are uh, very dangerous for personnel and other anti-vehicular uh, landmines, which are aimed at vehicles and particularly uh, armor. We've seen a lot of those in, in the videos. Not clear uh, how many of the anti-personnel landmines there are, but there clearly are uh, some. Uh, it's going to take some time to clear those uh, out. You know, some of them are lying on the surface and relatively easy, but uh, to make the area safe for civilians, it's going to take 
uh, some effort after the war. Colonel, we're hearing President Biden now use words like <clears throat> genocide and, and, and that Washington is promising to step up their efforts to help Ukraine by sending more military uh, weapons. Uh, we've got other countries, Slovakia, they're sending S-300s to Ukraine to help defend themselves. Uh, in other countries, javelins, uh, the in-laws, a lot of the terminology of weapons that we haven't seen or heard of in, in years. What does this suggest uh, that we might be doing to, to, course, to sort of step up our efforts to help? Well, I think everyone's getting a crash course in military weaponry. Um, the United States and NATO and the Allies have been sending a lot of uh, equipment and munitions to Ukraine uh, from be even before the war began. Of course, the javelins are the best known as a, the sort of top of the line anti-tank weapon. These uh, N-laws are also uh, anti-tank weapons. We've supplied a lot of them. They're very effective. Uh, and together, they've um, allowed the Ukrainians to blunt the uh, Russian offensive. They've allowed the, um, the Russians to, or rather the Ukrainians, to maintain their forces in the field, keep them well supplied and also to equip these new militias that were created at the beginning of the war and are now uh, uh, being trained and uh, fielded. Uh, and it's critically important that that continue. You're also seeing some, um, what you might call major weapon systems being delivered, uh, the S-300s, uh, the T-72 tanks. I suspect that the Polish uh, MiGs are gonna show up in uh, Ukraine at some point. These are systems that the Ukrainians already own, so they have the trained personnel and they have the logistics pipeline to operate them. It's not possible to give the Ukrainians uh, equipment they haven't seen before. You can't send them a, a Patriot anti-aircraft uh, missile battery. You can't send them an M1 tank because it would take years to set up the training uh, establishment and the logistics pipeline. Uh, we heard Colonel uh, Vladimir Putin say peace talks have reached a dead end with Ukraine. It seems that uh, he is locked in. How long could this go on? Well, there's a debate in the community about just how long this could go on. There were some people who believe it could go on for quite a while, and Putin seems to be signaling that, and that would entail a long war of attrition, you know, maybe not a lot of movement on the front uh, lines, but continuing uh, casualties and destruction. Uh, it's not clear how long the Russian military can uh, hold on. I'm surprised that they've done uh, as well as they have. You know, they've had severe morale problems. They've taken a lot of casualties, uh, had a lot of equipment losses. So one school of thought says that the Russian military may not be able to uh, fight indefinitely. And at some point, the generals may tell Putin that he needs to uh, make a deal. Well, and certainly our thoughts and prayers go to all the civilians and just the people, the exhaustion, the emotions that must be running through the, the, those that live in Ukraine. I, I can't even imagine. Uh, thank you for your time, as always, explaining, kind of breaking down logistics of, of what's going on and we can, what we can maybe uh, expect. Uh, retired uh, Marine Colonel Mark Hansen, thanks again for being on our show. Thanks for having me on the show.